Gana Marta. Uh, I am a lawyer, and uh, therefore I will speak uh, from a legal perspective. But before starting my presentation, I would like to introduce uh, a preliminary remark about what the law can do about disability or in general about uh, human values. The law, in my view, cannot do all the job. Uh, we tend, in general, to overstate uh, the, the role of legislation. Um, I don't want to underestimate uh, that good legal structure can help, uh, or at least can be not so much detrimental. So we still have to reason about uh, what is the most beneficial contribution and the legal framework that can help uh, and can help uh, the, uh, our social life and, and our common good, but do not rely too much on legislation. Uh, having said that, and I was very much sympathetic with the Baroness Collins when she says now that I am a lawmaker, I understand that, that law uh, is not that helpful or maybe also unhelpful for the situation of people with disability. Having said that, uh, let's start from a point that uh, everybody considers as a turning point in the history of the legislation about disability, which is the UN Convention of Rights uh, uh, of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, it was uh, really a big change in our social understanding of disability because it put uh, human dignity in the center, speaks about uh, fundamental rights, uh, helped and pushed uh, uh, social institution uh, in advancing inclusivity, um, removing discrimination, prejudice, and stigma. And uh, there is a big change that we are witnessing, especially in Europe in this context, that is described in the paper. The paper, I apologize, is much too long. I will summarize some essential points uh, on which I would like to draw your attention. Why the Convention of the United Nations is so important, uh, I think that has already been said by the previous uh, speakers, in particular by Matilde Leonardi, where she uh, highlighted that the idea behind the Convention, and I quote the first article, is that persons with disability include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers uh, may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So in the, the big contribution of the convention is that it stresses the idea that disability is not a physical, or mental, or sensorial impairment as such. An impairment, weakness, dysfunction become an issue of disability in the interaction with the surrounding context, environment, where barriers and obstacles become an impediment to social participation. That's why lawyers has some, have something to do, because we can work not on the side of the impairment, but at least on the side of the social barriers. Um, the, 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 I would like to focus my, my presentation uh, on one instrument that has been at the center of, one legal instrument that has been at the center of the UN Convention and uh, is developing and this is being disseminating a little bit all over the world. And this idea is the idea of uh, the reasonable accommodation as a corner store in legislation pertaining to individuals with disabilities. This instrument has proved to be one of the most effective as well as one of the most flexible and suitable to improve inclusion and full participation of persons with disability in social life. In fact, the convention, according to that definition of disability, 
requires much more than refraining from open and direct discrimination, nor are sufficient in the ideas of the convention, the traditional economic benefits and social services or medical treatments which are relevant but not enough provided by the legislation on this matter. The effort required by the convention is to remove as much as possible the factual barriers that in the standard, let's say, daily life, in fact, hinder the participation of disabled people in social life. What is reasonable accommodation? This instrument, to my knowledge, took origin in Canadian anti-discrimination law. It requires all kinds of subjects, employers, landlords, public and private service providers, to accommodate the need of individuals in order to ensure that they can enjoy equal opportunity in social life. This could mean, for example, permitting an employee not to work on a religious holiday or create an appropriate workplace for a person with physical disability. In Canada, reasonable accommodation applies to all forms of discriminations based on sex, gender, ethnic origin, color, age, religion, and indeed disability. It is widely applied in labor law, but it has a larger scope of application. Eventually, in the 90s, reasonable accommodation became very influential in the American law with the American uh, with Disability Act of the 1990. And not surprising then, at the time of the negotiations of the UN Convention, reasonable accommodation was at the center of the legal framework. And it is defined at Article 2. Reasonable accommodation means necessary and appropriate modification and adjustment of the environment not imposing this pro a disproportionate or undue burden where needed in a particular case to ensure to persons with disability the enjoyment or exercise on an equal basis with others of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. All human universal rights, but in an individual uh, in an individual kind of application. Similar definition is provided by the EU Directive of 2000. I'm not going to repeat and to reread the definition. There are some five features of this instrument, these legal instruments that, in my view, are valuable or at least are interesting to debate. First, the duty to accommodate is an obligation for public as well as for private actors. Reasonable accommodation is widely applied in labor law so that the duty to accommodate falls, first of all, on employers. Yet the same duty bounds local and national institutions, schools, other educational facility, sport facilities, movie theaters, commercial activities, music institutions, prisons, and other infrastructure. I provide a number of cases and examples. I do not have those beautiful stories uh, uh, to tell you in order to explain how things work, but at least in case law, we can find concrete examples of, uh, of life. For example, I just mentioned uh, a case uh, from the European Court of Human Rights of 2016 so where a student uh, was refused by the Turkish National Music Academy because she was blind. The applicant was completely qualified for admission to the academy and the refusal had been based only and solely on her disability. The court said that the failure 
to accommodate, to provide reasonable accommodation to facilitate the access for such a student was a form of discrimination. So, you know, just an example to see how universal can be and how demanding from all kinds of social actors is this instrument. In prisons, it's very important. You have a number of people with the mental or physical disabilities in prisons, and this is a huge problem of our uh, detention centers. But I don't want to insist too much on this. The second feature that I've already mentioned uh, illustrating the previous case is that the unjustified refusal to prom provide reasonable accommodation is considered a form of discrimination. You know, not just direct discrimination, but somebody who does not at least uh, uh, try to provide this reasonable accommodation is discriminating against the person with disability. And the UN Convention expressly provide in this sense, in Article 2 and 5, the jurisprudence of the European Court, uh, both uh, in the Council of Europe and uh, the European Union, consistently applies this principle. Third, uh, this is one of the features that I consider the most relevant. One of the distinctive features of reasonable accommodation is that it triggers a process. It opens a process of dialogue between the parties involved, rather than simply prescribing an outcome predetermined by law. Law not as a provider of solution and result, but as demanding to open a dialogue and the process uh, of the process that the result of which can vary case by case. Sometimes it can achieve the expected result by the person with disability. In other cases, the request proves to be impossible or too burdensome. The result of reasonable accommodation cannot pre be pre-established. The law is prescriptive in the sense that it mandates to start a process and fixes some essential rules of the game, but the solution is to be found in dialogue with all the parties involved. What is relevant is that it calls upon all the parties to be creative and sincere in negotiating and finding solution. This is, in my view, an interesting aspect of this legal instrument, because it urges the parties to engage in a relationship. The duty holder and the individual seeking for accommodation are expected to work together to develop a mutual understanding of reciprocal needs and constraints and to get to a solution that can be reasonable for and sustainable for all the parties. It is based on a paradigm of trust in social relations rather than distrust and coercion. Fourth, for teacher, reasonable accommodation does not overlook the cost the, the, the problem of resources of whatever nature imposed on the duty holder. In fact, it imposes an obligation to accommodate up to undue hardship. These are the words in the convention. The accommodation required by the legislation is qualified as reasonable because it takes into account also the context, the constraints deriving from economic issues and social relations. Indeed, uh, there is no uh, standard definition of what amount to undue hardship, yet in the case law, especially in Canada and in other uh, jurisdictions, some factors are emerging, like financial costs to an organization, provided they reach a substantial amount, 
the risks for health and safety of the disabled people or other fellowship, fellow employees or in general public, and indeed other conflicti conflicting rights. The key word here is proportionality between different interests and different needs. Um, the for example, uh, with the people that have uh, mm, visual uh, impairments, uh, there are cases in which uh, uh, the, the, the case law says uh, that uh, it is necessary to uh, remove their driver license, but there are cases, especially at the beginning, at the origin of reasonable accommodation in Canada, that concerned a person that did not have peripheral vision, that the court considered that that was not a good reason to remove the driver license. So. You see, it's flexible depending on the situation and the case, on a case-by-case -case basis. And this brings us to the fifth and final feature of reasonable accommodation, is that it always requires case-by-case solutions rather than general rules and general standards. In fact, disability can hardly be approached with a one-size-fits-all measures. Persons with disability need tailored suits. I don't think that I'm contradicting the previous speaker. I'm just developing on the same idea of this tension between universal rights with the appropriate individual measures of implementation. The reason is simple and yet is often overlooked. Matilde Leonardi has insisted in saying and stressing that disability is a continuum. And in fact, the border between disability and functionality is blurred. All people can be located in this continuum, as we have heard. No single person with disability is similar to the next one, nor are the social conditions where she or he lives. Each person with disability is unique and has special needs as well as special capabilities. This condition of people with disability pose poses a challenge for lawmakers, a big challenge for lawmakers. Because, in fact, usually, law provides rules for a given category of people, apply regulation to groups. And yet, when we deal with people with disability, there are no clear borders between different groups of people. And even if you want to put a category of disabled people, each of them are very different. So disability calls for a new approach to legislation. It entails crafting regulations that are flexible enough to accommodate the unique circumstances of each individual cases. For example, I take an example from, an, again from the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, Disabled people uh, with a psychiatric condition under partial guardianship. It was a, an Hungarian case. All these people were uh, prevented to uh, vote in any kind of election because of their condition. The court considered that uh, treating people with the mental abilities in a, a mental disability is a single group was a questionable classification and concluded that the court could not accept an absolute bar on voting rights applied to any person under partial guardianship, irrespective of his or her actual faculties. This is a big problem for legislators. How can you write a rule able to accommodate to, 
to include the specific unique feature of each king, uh, single case. But it is interesting because it is a challenge in my view that concerns not only uh, the fields of disability but many other situations. Anyway, from the previous overview and insisting on reasonable accommodation with its uh, five features, uh, I think that we have learned uh, that uh, relations uh, are very relevant uh, in disability legislation in three different perspectives. First, uh, disability impacts not only for the good or for the bad. Uh, and we have learned how many things we can learn having uh, in a family a member with disability but it impacts not only the life of the individuals, but also those of the people surrounding them, parents, siblings, uh, uh, schoolmates, uh, fellow workers. Uh, that is why, for example, labor law provides special benefits for parents with, uh, of children with disability in general, and the law provides benefits for the caregivers or person with disability. Second, uh, the aim of uh, this uh, recent legislation is to advance inclusion, that is improving the relational life uh, of people with disability, from education to sport, from employment to cultural activity. The quality of the relations that we have learned this morning, uh, that a person with disability is able to cultivate, can make the difference. Uh, as the same person may have entirely different experiences in very relational context. To put it bluntly, inclusion and participation is a matter of relation. Thirdly, as we have heard, the cornerstone of disability legislation is reasonable accommodation, which implies a relational approach rather than a rules-based one. All in all, reasonable accommodation is based on a duty of solidarity or shared responsibility of all social, social actors. Again, it is a matter of relations. I would like to conclude uh, on this note uh, with a few more comments, if I have a few minutes. Uh, two or three minutes. OK, I will try to go, to go very quickly. Um, let me read the, the, the first words of a book that I consider, that changed a little bit my perspective about legislation some years ago. It's a book written by Jennifer Nedelsky, the title of which is Laws Relations, where she outlines a relational theory of self, autonomy, and law. I quote, relationship are central to people's life, to who we are, to the, capa the capacities we are able to develop, to what we value, what we suffer, and what we enjoy. And she advocates to move relationship from the periphery to the center of legal and political thought and practice. I think that uh, She's right, she's right, because we have by far underestimated, even in the legal discourse on human rights, the role of relations. Our legal culture would gain a lot from a reasoning that put relation at the center. But here we face a challenge for the years to come. Because even the UN Convention that was so beneficial still insists and reflects, in my view, an individualistic culture of human rights where human dignity is considered as an equivalent of autonomy and independence, which is important. But in, especially in the realms of, di of disability, we need to understand and to handle with care independence, self-determination, freedom of choice, and similar concepts. Because 
we cannot equate this uh, concept uh, as a sort of do it on your own, a sort of abandonment. We need to work deeper on this idea of dignity as autonomy. I have some cases, but I don't want to insist on the cases because it takes too much time. Uh, there they are cases of people that are uh, um, under custody with mental uh, disability problems that committed suicide and were justified by the European Court in the name of autonomy and independence. And there were some important dissenting opinions of some judges saying, be careful because uh, we cannot overlook uh, the vulnerable, vulnerable situation of these people in order to stress their autonomy. I think that there is a lesson to be learned from these tragic cases uh, for all, not only for people with disability, because it's a matter of, of realism. Living independently cannot be interpreted as living on our own, not for nobody in our contemporary society, nobody is completely independent. As a matter of fact, we live in a state of mutual interdependence. And I think that a lot of a good contribution can derive from the reading of the last works by Chiara Giaccardi and Mauro Magatti, where they insist on the idea of interindependence. They do not artificially separate the claim for autonomy and freedom from the need for connection and relationship that are intertwined in the fabric of human experience. Uh, we have heard uh, in the previous presentation uh, a number of times uh, repeated the, the word support. Uh, I think that this is a key word. Uh, not people with disability, or in any case, uh, people uh, do not need to be substituted in their duties, in their tasks to be discharged. But in many cases, they, be, they need to be supported. We need uh, to work on the idea of autonomy with support, like, for example, we have in many experiences uh, with the support teachers uh, or the administratore di sostegno, a sort of uh, uh, caretaker, support administration, administrator for the elderly or the people that uh, go through a difficult moment of their life. I think that this is a point that we need to work on. Jennifer Nedelskin and, on the other hand, Chiara Giaccardi and uh, Mauro Magatti helps us to understand uh, that we should not be trapped uh, into the alternative between the individualistic, liberal, uh, autonomy-based idea of human dignity or the communitarian understanding. We have been trapped in the legal culture between these two alternatives. They, on the contrary, work on the idea that the capacity for autonomy can only develop and thrive when fostered by constructive relationships, such as those with partners, teachers, friends, parents, and agents of the state. This is a paradox of human experience. Autonomy requires good relations, not only at the early stages of children's development, but in all ages and in all conditions of life. I think that here there is a lesson that we can learn from the experience of people with disability as paradoxical as it may sound, in order to be autonomous, we need others. Thank you so much.